the moment. Our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your hosts. Jeff Nerf Herder Chandler. Jim Kaiju Baker. And Mike Mjolnir Evans. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. All right, welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Thank Hello. you. Our oh. first post 50th show here. Next episode will be our season finale. I don't know if we're going to have a cliffhanger, what we can possibly do to top mm. our 50th episode. Will we be renewed for another season? That is oh, the question. we're in control of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our listeners can barely contain themselves now, waiting a whole week to listen to this. I know. Hey, we've got a small but loyal cult following. Yeah, your checks are in the mail, by the way. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So this week, whoo! <laughs> I need a cigarette. I don't think any of us were prepared for what we endured through this uh, odyssey. In a, in a really deviant fashion, we did not, this was not predetermined by us whatsoever, but we're mixing a Disney movie up with Love, Death, and Robots. So it feels like we're insidious, Dr. Evil sitting yeah. here, you know, rubbing our hands together. <laughs> But no, that's not the case. It was just a happy or unhappy. It starts with freaking laser beams. Do we have any news, Jeff? Is it I don't really have any news because I really want to start talking about this show. But if anybody else has some news, we can share. Otherwise, we can just get into it. I just read something yesterday about a uh, North Bergen High School stage production of the original Alien. Alien, about right? Alien. I did see that. I did see pretty, that. It looks pretty good. They, they're playing the movie on a big screen behind them as they were going through. Oh, that would be distracting. The thing is, is that they can't obviously do a lot of the big special effects. So no, they, I know, but... You like when Ripley away. blows the alien out of the airlock. No, but you can get away with, listen, stage theatrics, you can get away with a lot of crap, you know, because with the, lighting. The clip that I saw was like a full-blown alien suit, which I don't okay. know how they pulled off, a high school. Wow. Club. So Ripley there. in a white spacesuit looking almost exactly like the one she wears. Really? Has a fake harpoon gun, which does not shoot anything, but she okay. pretends to shoot. Right. The alien goes out these two doors that are probably slid together by two kids that are, you know. Oh, yeah, the old Star Trek. Uh, on the other side. Adage. So then you see the screen kick in and the, the alien being. Oh, okay. So it's not the full movie. It's not the full movie. Okay, they're just gotcha. Taking certain right. scenes and, and playing okay. against what they're doing on stage. I would think that would be counterproductive to actually yeah. having live actors. Then you're just, yeah, watching the movie instead of watching what's on. Right, exactly. I would have liked them to do it as a musical review. I, I you know, that would be write some no. <laughs> like you said. If you could, if you can break into song in King Kong, yeah, you, Face you can do... hug off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great! He comes out and takes a bow at the end. Yeah, space hugger. Okay, so we've Let's been go. hearing some positive buzz about this love death and robots and which yeah, led us kind of to... popped up on the horizon yeah just kind of showed up so i think it's only been available on netflix for me a little over a week if that Ooh, we're pressing we're on the cusp yes cutting edge right now so we may have seen this before most of you listening will have the chance to uh, i don't think that we're gonna have a lot of spoilers because i don't think that these episodes if you want to call them that are spoiler centric it's not like that there's any big reveal in the no the there's maybe the one that borders on a twilight zone twist ending kind of a thing but otherwise they are really if anyone is familiar with uh heavy metal which was a french magazine that came out 70s yeah, definitely which, 70s it and it was just a it was a mix uh anthology of short stories really kind of the precursor to the graphic novel I mean, it wasn't really a comic book because it was a magazine format and there were maybe seven, eight stories per issue. Some of them ran two pages, some of them ran 12 pages. Different artists, different styles, different genres type of thing. 
And then they made a movie in 81, which was, that was, you know, as a kid watching that. And all of a sudden you start seeing some uh, animated genitalia. We were kind of <laughs> like, what the hell? But yeah, uh, Heavy Metal was uh, very much an adult that act. was kind of our first exposure to that type of thing is you know and then you back ended the lack of a better know, term fritz, fritz uh, the cat and some of that other exactly, stuff exactly yeah i was gonna say there. fritz the cat was more of a, um, yeah. a taboo cartoon that i yeah. i never had the opportunity to see but at least heavy metal was available on the you know your hbo so. yeah it was on hbo for a while yeah. and that was it was pretty wild it was it was Unlike anything you'd ever seen. The only thing I could compare it to from back then is the Ralph Bashke, uh Lord of the Rings type animation. Yeah, although Bilbo kept his clothes on <laughs> in that one. Yeah, Bilbo kept his Gollum Bilbo, didn't uh... go down on him. <laughs> My precious. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually, I'm sure probably, Jeff, you know a little bit of the history. This is um, partly presented by David Fincher and Tim Miller, who is the director of our beloved Deadpool, the first yeah. Deadpool. So that's a, that's a pretty high pedigree right yeah. there, Fincher. And originally, it was going to be a reboot of Heavy Metal. That's yeah, what this is, basically. Cool. Which I, Ivan Reitman was attached somehow with the original Heavy Metal ma uh, movie. I don't know if he was executive producer or if he directed one of the segments. But Really? Uh, Ghostbusters, Ivan Reitman? Yep, pre-Ghostbusters. Yeah. So this has turned into, rather than a movie, an anthology series now on Netflix. And it's 18 episodes deep. Which sounds daunting. Yes. But when you realize the long longest is 18 minutes and the shortest is like six and with one exception they are all completely animated um with the two one different two. degrees yeah i mean we'll get into this there are a couple that border on so photorealistic that, that you question whether or not it's animated or if it's if it's live action or what the purpose is of even animating this if they were they're going to go so right, if photo going motion capture because there are a couple right there's really except for the one episode that you're talking about there really is no big name people attached to this and to me the the artists are the stars and you have everything from just flat 2D um, there's one episode that's like an anime manga but a lot of it is the CG right. motion capture kind of the stuff that just is, it, it reminds me of like Final Fantasy when that came out, but to the nth degree. And there are some that are, that are stronger than others as far as the um, illustration animation department. Now, Jeff, you say the animators animation are the stars. I say the male genitalia is the star. <laughs> well, they do make a guest appearance more than once. At the beginning of each of these episodes, what you get is like a slot machine effect with three, like, you know, you're looking at a Lucky Sevens machine, a slot machine, yeah. and it pulls up three graphics of kind of what you're about to see in whatever episode you've got. And that's clever. Up. That's very clever. Yeah, and one of them had a little boobs with a, I noticed, mm -hmm. that had yep. like a bra. I really think that they should have put a set of testicles just to warn you. That <laughs> you that know at some point the... somebody came up with that and they were like, that's too much. Because some of them, especially that one episode called The Dump, there's one oh, yeah. gentleman who yeah. is uh, relieving himself in a, in a junkyard whose package is just like a hose, <laughs> like an elephant <laughs> trunk hanging down, swinging back and forth like a pendulum, like a grand. And you can't look away from it. <laughs> He's running with his pants down and you're just like, wait a minute, who? Who spent the hours rendering that? Yeah, and, and is this really necessary for what is actually about to happen? No, it's Photo not apropos to anything, you know? No, so, no. So. <laughs> it's not integral to the storyline. No. <laughs> so, and there's a few episodes. There's a handful of these episodes really do push the envelope in terms of nudity. And it's funny to me because those episodes I don't think are as effective as the ones that don't you utilize it at all. So, right. uh, you know, it's just titillation for titillation's sake. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, it's like the animators, it's, somebody threw it out there and like, listen, we're putting this thing together and, you know, there's a lot of cursing. The F-bomb is dropped left and right. Probably you know. in every episode, at least Probably, one. yeah. Every yeah. episode, yeah. Yeah, they said no holds barred. So let's get into this. Let's talk about some of the individual episodes. What, do you want to go maybe like top three? Yeah. Ones that the, stuck out to you? Maybe top three and like bottom three. We could. Okay. I could that. do that. We could do it like we did last week. It was tough. Victory. I will say for, for 18. Now I broke it up over a couple of days. I didn't sit there and watch one after the other. And just like all the other Netflix shows, the one thing that I don't like is the fact that it gleams straight through. You can cut off the credits because like I said, the animation is just unlike anything you've ever seen. 
And for me to be able to sit there and actually look at some of the names that are associated with this, you know, you don't get the chance because by the time you hit the pause button, you're already on to the next episode. Even the good episodes, they're so short that by the time you're getting into it, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, some of these can't sustain a 90 minute hour and a half. You know, again, I, I go back to Twilight Zone, short little vignette, you, you know, the, the very concise, the, the writers, the storytellers have a point of view, they have a story to tell. And if it takes 10 minutes, it takes 10 minutes. If it takes 20 minutes, it takes 20 minutes. And that's yeah. it. There's no fluff. Yes. Well, it's a do you remember. So, you know, we mentioned heavy metal, but Mike, you brought up Aeon Flux last week. Yes. And that's kind of what the, you remember MTV really kind of went with that formula with liquid television. Yes, it did. Where they had Aeon Flux and you had the Max, which was based on Sam Keith's uh, comic book from Image. And then you just had like these little short, Stories. I remember going into the, the village years ago to the Sick and Twisted Animation Festival. And that's the first time I ever saw Beavis and Butthead. And they were just these short little, you know, Bill Plimpton, little six minute animated stories. Some of them weren't even stories. They were just artistic doodles. So this was, this is kind of taking that to the next level yeah. for sure. Yeah, and Aeon Flux in its way was kind of like the TV version of a comic strip that you see in a daily newspaper because you only get three panels. And for Aeon Flux, it was, like you said, only a few minutes long, just yeah. enough to kind of, and I don't even know, I don't know how uh, chronological liquid television was if you even saw these episodes in order like you were no i don't think well i think they didn't need to be each one was kind of like a little standalone and that's when why the movie which just happened to be on last night with charlie Theron, they did a live action version of aeon flux i think 2005 it was just horrific because again you you're taking um an animated short and trying to stretch it out to a 90 minute, you know, two hour story. Yeah. Charlize was much more successful in atomic blonde, I think as a, yeah. as an action heroine. So yeah, let's get into, All right, uh, let's do it. Top three. I'll do top three roundabout. Okay. Beyond the Aquila rift. Aquila, 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 yeah. Aquila. Yeah. Aquila. So this is that episode that we were talking about before that does have a spoiler at the end. So I will not get into that, but it's, yes. uh, Kind of like a, an alien type setup where you've got a crew going into hypersleep and going into deep space, and they're going to wake up when they connect with a space station out in the in the distance, in the many many light years away, and things do not go as they plan when they wake up. So I'll just <laughs> I really don't want to get into it much more than that. The captain of this ship, uh, forget what his name is now. Yeah, I don't remember either. The character's name is. They wake up and a woman that he hasn't seen in quite some time that he thought was dead greets him and says that he's been in hypersleep for much more than he thought, that he's gone out much farther than he thought, and that's where she's been stuck as well. And the uh, the rest of his crew is a little suspicious of her, and rightfully so. So that's all I'll say. But I think it was, this took me a couple of watches, actually, to completely get where they were going with this, because I missed a few things on the first time around, just because it is so fast and frenetic, and you kind of get overwhelmed by the love scenes, I'll put Yeah, to. yeah, there's some straight up, that, that is some straight up voyeuristic uh, porn. Yeah, and there is one pretty intense one. This is the only one on my top three that actually had any type of a nude scene in it, so it was still Might well, as well. Done. I will say this this was my number one. Was it? Yeah. This this is animation wise, visually, the design of the for lack of a better term, the jump gate that they used. Yes, yes. Um just it, it's definitely motion capture because if you look at the actors who uh, did the voices, they look just like the characters. They look exactly like the characters. So like what you were saying before, Jim, which is so if you're gonna go to that extent why even make it animated <laughs> you know just film it on a green screen and maybe they did i don't know it was hard for me to do a lot of background research on some of these animations to, to just find out like a lot of these are short stories you know they're based on short stories that are out there in french publications and uh, sci-fi novels over the last couple of years but this was just so beautifully rendered and it does it is the one episode that borders on being twilight zone where it does have a, a kind of a twist ending, even though you kind of realize and you see where it's going for the 16 minutes, you're completely invested in this story. I was blown away by it. I was just sitting there going, is that a real woman or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that character in particular. Right. And does yeah. it matter? Right. That's the bigger question. Does it matter? It didn't. Not to me. No, no right. Exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, and again, it harkened back to Alien. There's like a little bit of the Matrix seeping in there. And, I don't uh, think any of these kind of border on that because you're dealing with most of them are sci-fi outer space. I mean, it has robots right in the title. So it's either love, death, or robots. So most of them, there's a handful that don't adhere to that formula at all, which I found interesting. There's one episode where she's straight up surveying a planet, LV-426. Really? Which episode yes, was that? that was I didn't the, catch that. What? Oh, that was Helping Hand. That was the one where the girl was outside the space station. Yeah. yeah okay. She was on, she was whatever. And she mentions yeah. LV-426. And oh yeah, my God, my that's favorite, a little too, right? you know, on the nose, I guess, if you're going to make a reference. So, oh. but, uh, but yeah, you can't, there's a point where you can't, not pick up on some of those alien vibes or some of this, you know, we've seen way too many stories that exist in the, in these environments, dark, dirty, dusty spaceship. So, but yeah, I love that. I love that episode. I gave that a solid five strong in my top three as well. Cool. Mike, you want to, since I already gave away my number one, uh, I would say for me, three robots. That is, and it's the second episode. So it's like, you start off with a, with a bang. Yeah. It is so much fun because it just, it's different. Yeah, you have the three robots sort of touring the post-apocalyptic um, world and just having a lot of fun doing them. Each of them have their own personalities that interact mm-hmm. well with each other um, and just thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, I was like, now I'm on for this ride. Yeah, it's funny. And it does seem to be a recurring theme between severed severed limbs and cats. Cats, yes. yes. Cats. There's a lot of cats. And the cats play big in this episode. And I like the fact that the robots don't necessarily have to be super smart either. Like, they can be just like a dumb American tourist. Uh, we are fucking lost, aren't we? Lost? Okay, that's rich. Uh, let's see. We just passed the Ravage Church. There is the blood pit. Uh, ah, this way. Here we go. Breathtaking. It's more beautiful than in the brochures. Come on, giddy up, guys. We've got so much to see. you seen one post-apocalyptic city. You've seen them all. Just like and that's exactly of- right. They actually were right. The one was like thrilled that he was there. It was like a historical landmark that he was coming to see. The- and they did a straight up uh, Terminator where you got the human when he, skull. When he steps on the and skull. He steps yeah. on the skull right off the bat. So, yeah, that's a good one. That was really good. Would you put it in your top three? It was not in my top three, yeah. but I gave it a four or five. Yeah, not in my top three either, but it was close. But out of 18, it's hard to kind of say that one's – superior and this one sucked i don't think any of them sucked all right so jeff what's your number three uh my number three was fish night which was an interesting fish night was on my bottom three (laughs) yeah mine too so this is where we talked last time and i brought this up and mike called me out on it which is rotoscoping do you ever see the movie a scanner darkly with keanu reeves yes so it's where and this is the style of this animation which is it's filmed you're filming actors performing but then you're going back over and you're drawing over the film frame by frame to animate it and so to a certain effect it's a very cartoony it's just it's what two sales guys who who their car breaks down in the desert it's a very simplistic story but visually i was blown away by it you know one's an older guy one's a young guy he's just makes an offhand comment about you know at one point this was all ocean how come human ghosts can come back and haunt but you know you never see any haunting animals and sure enough the sun goes down and all of a sudden all these sea creatures start floating around and swimming around them uh and i'm not going to say any more about it but visually i thought it was really well done i like to visually did not care for the story yeah well that's that's what i'm saying which is some of these um you know i i'm i'm putting the animation over the story content and vice versa sometimes i really like the story but didn't care for the animation Mm. So, yeah, but that was yeah. my number three. I yeah, thought my it was problem different. with Fish Night was um, that the, the old man. There was no real explanation as to how this was happening, other than the old man just said it, and then it was so right. Yeah, yeah. but again, like you said, you don't have an hour and a half to set up. Right, it's just like things happen. You don't have time to establish who these guys were, or, or right. You said, does this happen every night? Do they just wait for people to be abandoned in the desert and then show up? Or it doesn't matter. You just go with it. Twilight Zone. I didn't go with it. No, (laughs) which is fine, which is great. I think we've all gone for number three. So my number two was this was tough. I had to choose between when the yogurt took over and Zima Blue, and I think Zima Blue edged out. 
I really love the the change up of animation styles because Zima Blue is right in the middle of a of a clutch of these that really look like hyper stylized PlayStation type graphics, whereas yep. over realized computer graphics, you know, you can tell it's all actors with like the little bumps all over their faces and just to get the motion capture. Yeah. Zima Blue was a return to like a true animation type style. And I liked, you know, it, it, it resonated with me for some reason. It was a story about an artist he is later revealed to be a robot himself that starts off as a pool cleaning robot and then kind of is modified, you know, by different owners until he becomes sentient that he's free thinking and he becomes an artist and he's making up these paintings that all have this little blue square or rectangle in the middle of them, which you find out later is a reference to the swimming pool that he used to clean. Is so, this, is it, he's like the Banksy of, uh, he is. Yes. Future. And I just love the way that that blue popped. He did that. I really liked the Zima blue. I thought it was a very soothing color. So, uh, so, so that was my number two. It's a good one. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, that was in my bottom three. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I loved visually. I loved it. I thought it was phenomenal, but it was it didn't it did not resonate with me. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm gonna take one that may be on your bottom, which is the witness. And I that think was oh yeah, I yeah. did not so, like that one. Yeah, yeah that this was is, phenomenal. Yeah. It this is, is not my top three, but it was well done. This is the one where it's uh, the woman um, witnesses a, a murder and starts to flee the city, and it's probably the best directed one. But wait, yeah, one. Mike, Mike, anything you say has to have the word naked in it. Yes. This woman <laughs> nakedly fleeing the city in her nakedness. You know, that's you just need to emphasize that because it is very overemphasized in the actual short. It is, and that was on my first watching of this. I thought uh, it's too much. You don't need all of this. It's not necessary. But if you go back and you look at it just from a cinematography standpoint, you're like, this is just a well-directed short. And, and then that, again, right? You, you're you're questioning. Am I? What am I? Wa am I watching live action? Because it was so hyper real. But the camera work was. I mean, it's it reminded me a lot of Run Lola Run which is all handheld camera kind of a thing, following them to the staircase. She's running, you know, to and fro, and it's not... Yeah, to and fro is a good... Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> um, they were all very perky, by the way, I will say. You brought up before, Jim, which was the, the fact that Zima Blue was, was kind of surrounded by all these hyper-real animated styles, and then when you brought in this, this clean cut, almost like, like a 2D... Uh, flat animation it really stands out uh one of the things i i realized uh and i read it somewhere which is netflix was changing up the episode order based on yeah i've read this too to what effect though i don't understand like to me it's like how like what does that quantify why to yeah. what and judging from our conversation already i think we all got the same order so um if yeah. three robots was your number two then that's yep. the order that i got my number two yeah. with the witness being right after that yeah i yeah i don't know the the witness was very well done that is phenomenal again it's it's kind of hard to kind of just pick and, but again i just thought it was unnecessary the the level of nudity in that and the I fact that she's a stripper and you go through her entire striptease routine which is quite graphic before you even get into the chase well i just want to say to the animators thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> well done well done <laughs> bravo <laughs> Do you also want to thank the uh, shapeshifters, the dump, and uh, <laughs> Tucker of Souls for the the grandfather clock pendulums going on? Yeah, no, the dump, I'll, the dump I'll pass on to Hillbilly. I've seen too many Hillbilly pipe penises in my day. So. Uh, what are we at, number two? I think we're at number two. I think you're up, Jeff. I'm up? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with this one. I don't know if this is even close to any of your list. Uh, good Hunting. This was the one. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Chinese, the Chinese guy. It, it's... It's kind of like a steampunk oh, yes, yes. Where, where the girl, it's, it's really a weird inclusion. It takes you through this history. Uh, she's like a shapeshifter type of a thing. She becomes human. She loses her ability to become like this fox-like creature. But over time, you see the evolution of the city they live in. And he becomes technologically advanced. And he starts creating all these mecha robot animals. And he builds her a suit so she can become her true form again. But she goes out exacting revenge on old men who are abusing women. So it's a very steampunky uh, Victorian age, uh, weird mishmash of stuff going on. But I really like I like the animation and I like the story. I thought it was different. 
You see, this one was also towards the bottom of my yeah. list because it was another one of those where I thought it was just unnecessarily graphic. And graphic. The nudity. Yeah. I don't need to see what Jabba the Hutt would look like with a, an erection. We shall hook up on top penis. <laughs> and the whole thing about uh, them turning her into a robot at the end was kind of a stretch for me as well. Like they had to disavow <laughs> The plausibility went out the window for you on yeah, that one. At that point, because they were cutting her in half before they actually... That is true, they did. Yeah. Like, well, how do they do that? Well, so what's one more realistic, that Topher Grace has an entire society living in his freezer? Well, the fact that that was just tongue-in-cheek. This one was not. <laughs> this was something else in cheek. <laughs> Wait, well taken. Yes. Fine. We are just mining the potty jokes today. Huh? We are. Well, this is this really deserves it. This this episode yeah. it really does. So there you go. Those are my top. Are three. these? Are we all through number twos now? Are we now hitting? I number think one? so. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we know Jeff's already. That was revealed. Yep. Mine was Ice Age. That was the live okay. action one. My that was pretty low on my list. <laughs> list. <laughs> I like the, the the mix of live action and um, animation. It was interesting. Do you know who that girl was? Because it took me a bit. Oh, yeah, no, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. She's, yeah. Uh, from Cloverfield. Yep, she was in Cloverfield. Uh, not, not the first Cloverfield, but the right, second. Right, the 10 Cloverfield yeah. lane. Uh, she was also uh, Ramona in uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which I'm not sure that either one of you have ever seen, but we need. Yes, I have. Okay. I have. All right. And she was also featured very prominently in the season of Fargo that featured Ewan McGregor as two twin characters. There you go. I did forget that. She's been around quite a bit in the past yeah. couple of years. And that was fun because when you first start out, you're like, all right, where is this going? Because yeah, so, it was so just what, yeah, what this action. is, is that a couple moving into a new apartment have this ancient refrigerator. Frigidaire. So they open up the freezer and they're, they're chipping through some of the ancient ice that's in there. And they find a little ice cube with what looks like a tiny woolly mammoth inside the ice cube. Which is kind of cool. So they go back to see if there's any more, and they notice after they, they dig some of the more of the ice out, there's a society in their freezer <clears throat> that is just advancing at a tremendous pace. So I love the fact that they're mining the frozen peas, which, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> which everybody has in their freezer. So yeah. that was just a great little throwaway thing. You see them going in, into the uh, Industrial Revolution. It's like a microcosm of the history of planet Earth. Like in the afternoon, they destroy themselves with nuclear annihilation, and then they close the door because Topher Grace has a sunburn from the from the nuclear blast. Yep. A couple hours later, they open it, and there's a great piece that's happened in the society. They continue to watch until the end of this day, this 24-hour period, when apparently time ends, and then that's it. And then the next day again, they're starting in prehistoric time. So it seems that um, all of creation plays out on a daily basis in their freezer. And there's a great little throwaway line because because things are accelerating at such a rate and they're sitting there looking in the freeze and they do a, a quick little cutaway of two construction workers and they're looking at them like these giant heads that are overlooking. He goes, he goes, why are they just staring at us? What a bunch of douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just because right they're looking for a millisecond but it's probably like eons for these people who just see these these giant monstrosities who may or may not be considered their gods kind of looking down upon them and, yeah, and, just, and, and the construction workers don't don't appear to be concerned whatsoever that there's these two giant heads looking no no yeah, yeah. maybe that's just the way it's always been so yeah that was my number one so i'm Mike, not sure and a silent um, I don't know if I put this as my number one. I, I think I'd like to reshuffle here for a moment. <laughs> I'm going to say I really enjoyed alternate histories. That which, was very funny. And it's different. Of, yeah, it's just one of the last ones that are out there. And it's different. And, uh, you know, the use of Hitler as your sort of protagonist in this was just fantastic. Yeah, it was clever. It was very clever. It would probably outside of the yogurt. No, I think this was the funniest one. The yogurt one was interesting i don't think it was necessarily funny but this was uh straight up it was meant to be funny for laughs. Although there was a little nudity in there so jim i, I know that, that is true that is true the list. <laughs> well no i question the the fact of using hitler as such as <laughs> a prominent feature in there but so the nudity didn't bother me uh, in this one <laughs> and at least it wasn't hitler's uh, nudity but let me tell you, there's one ep one of these episodes. It was called Sucker of Souls, which was about um, yeah. a, a team of mercenaries and uh, the the scientist or doctor that's hired them looking for the original Dracula. I believe that this particular piece of animation was only created 
for them to say the joke. Huh. Well, he's not the first man who got in trouble for eating a little pussy. Right, yeah. <laughs> the only reason that this episode exists, so they could get that joke out. They went nowhere else with the cats being able to ward off Dracula. No, oh, it was yeah. it was in my bottom three, definitely. <laughs> Bottom. But again, for some reason, that's the line that sticks with me. Out of all 18 of these episodes, is I don't think that I'll ever forget that one, line. Yeah. Yeah. That might have been the only use of the word. Has there been any that we really didn't like that we haven't brought up yet? Uh, the last one I didn't like, Secret War. Yeah, that was very all. similar to Suits and the fact of, you know, the similar aliens they were going after, right. the monsters. Yeah, yeah I thought Su- Suits was a, was a better story-wise. You're more invested in the characters. These were Russians, Russian soldiers. Um, Suits, Suits was like a Michael Bay. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, farm, farm guys who just happen to have mech suits uh, to, to ward off uh, aliens. Um, yeah, I liked uh, Secret War was my least favorite. Yeah, and I didn't like uh, Shapeshifters, the werewolf one. I thought oh, that I was... I did like that. I thought that was different because until that point, you didn't... Like, everything really kind of bordered on... Well, no, I guess the dump, which took place right before it, didn't really have any... It wasn't outer space or anything. I did like Shapeshifters. I think I, the reason I didn't like it was because of the animation, because it was, like, rudimentary. Uh, it was It was a step down from... Once you saw Beyond the Agil of Rift, or what, however you want to say that, like every nothing else, like everything else paled in comparison. Yeah. And it was that, that, was so that well done. It was that attempt at computer generated human, you know, like a like a yeah. realistic type of animation mm-hmm. that you would see in a better PS3 video game or what have yeah. you. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was dialed back a few years. So it wasn't yes, it, right. And it was more it was more in the Final Fantasy realm. Yeah. But like I said, some of this animation was just so spot on. Crazy how well it was done. What did you guys think of the first one, uh, Sunny's Edge? Sunny's Edge. That was a fun one to open with. Yeah. I thought that was, again, there's a lot of nudity in that right off the bat. I, I thought it was a good start. It was. It kind of really set the tone of what you could expect yeah. with the rest of it. I don't think Agreed. that they could have gone better with a with the first episode than no. Sunny's Edge. But yeah, it's I'm interesting to see. We... I wonder what the playlist order is like. I know. That's what I'm saying. How, how, that, how does that actually affect me as a viewer watching these? You know, whether whether I'm liking the funnier stuff up front or do I want to see the funny stuff? I don't know. I, that's, that was in somebody else's hand, I guess. And we did mention Helping Hand before. I didn't really like yeah. that one either. Would throwing something be able to project? Well, that's kinetic space? energy. I, I would like to think that they had some knowledge that that may or may not hold. I mean, that's the whole thrust of the storyline. Right. It, no well, point. it's kind of a gravity ripoff. There's another movie, an animated movie. I think it's called dead space or maybe that's a video game and the whole graphic the poster is just a severed hand floating in space so that's your story right there and then you've got 127 hours with uh franco tr- having to yeah right off, so a yeah, like i said between between the, the cats and the severed uh, limbs uh there was a motif so season two you know we did love death and robots so change up the genre a bit Oh, season two, maybe Love, Death, and Cowboys? Yeah. <laughs> Something. You can't just keep doing Love, Death, and Robots. It'll, it'll get played out. Yeah, I'm sure that the genitalia will be back in season two. Love, Death, and Genitalia. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> season two. Gen- Gen- or just down. name it, you know, there wasn't much love going on. Yeah, so just genitalia, no. Death, and no. Robots. A lot of death, though. And did you note that there, most of these episodes were written by the same guy? No. Philip Gillott. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. I liked it. I, I thought it was very well done. I thought it was a, a breath of fresh air for sure. Golly was home last week and we watched a handful of episodes right off the bat. And I know that she went back to school and immediately turned it on to all our friends. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I don't know if it's possible to give buckets to the whole thing. I, it's, I, yeah. I'd probably go, overall, I'd probably go a solid four. That this is that. just very well done. Yeah, I'd, I'd do three and a half. There you go. Of course you would. <laughs> Just unexpected. Yes. Yeah, right. very unexpected. A, a pleasant surprise. Shocking. <laughs> Kids, get out of the room quick. There's a yeah. penis on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In some cases, a not so pleasant surprise, but a yeah. surprise nonetheless. Go check it out. Definitely yeah, check it yeah. out. Please do. Let us know what you think. Yeah, it's just an innovative compilation of things, right? I mean, you weren't expecting this. You, you're used to binge watching, but not binge watching this type of thing. Now, was Heavy Metal rated R or was that? Oh, it has to have been. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 
Now, I wonder what this would have gotten. This would definitely have gotten an NC-17, I believe, if it was a theatrical release. But the reason I bring that up is because I found an old school drive-in ad that explains the 70s era rating system. So feast your ears on this. Jim Rex? What's Jim Rex? Would you believe a movie audience guide presented as a public service by this theater's management to help you select your motion picture entertainment? Well, that's what it is. And we urge you to learn these rating symbols and use them as a guide for you and your family. G means suggested for general audiences, all ages. M, suggested for mature audiences, parental discretion advised. R, restricted, persons under 16 not admitted unless accompanied by parent or adult guardian. X, persons under 16 will not be admitted. This seal in advertising indicates that the film was approved under the motion picture code of self-regulation. Okay, so we're back and we're moving on from Love, Death and Robots. And we have got Jeff's pick for that movie that you love that nobody else knows about. And Jeff, take it away. Uh, So this is Treasure Planet, which is a not well-beloved Disney movie, kind of flew under the radar 2002, kind of came on the heels, what do you, maybe Tarzan before this? It really was the kiss of death for 2D animation. Uh, And when was Atlantis? Was this before, was that before or after this Treasure Planet? Hmm. They were both around the same time. I want to say maybe Atlantis was after. Atlantis was 2001. 2001. So this came right out after. This was 2002. Uh, Lilo and Stitch around the same time as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, early 2000s. Yep. Yeah. This, I, I can't remember when the first time I ever saw this movie, but it is just a perennial favorite in my household. It is one of the first disney movies to really well no i mean you go back to i think even black cauldron they were using cg in in certain instances but you know they're building entire worlds and and ships uh using the 3d technology married with 2d and they use what they call uh deep canvas which was um a 3d painting program which they really used to a strong effect in tarzan where he was sliding down trees and r- jumping from limb to limb and that was all rendered in this in this program yes. I won't i'll have to say i watched this on blu-ray from my local library and yeah. all the scenes with the ships were amazing the animation was just incredible i was in awe of the of the clarity especially like the depth that you're talking about, Jeff, whenever yeah. you see a long shot of the ship or when they reveal the, the spaceport, which looks like a giant. Yeah, which is beautifully designed, right? It's a crescent yeah. moon, but as you pull in, it is a full on space station. Yep. Visually. So anybody who doesn't know, this is basically treasure Island in space. It is Robert Louis Stevenson's characters. You know, you got Jim Hawkins, you have long John silver, although he's just referred to as silver here. They did change up some of the names, but I think Billy Bones is still... But the directors are Ron Ron Clements and John Musker, and they've been around Disney for years. I mean, go back to Great Mouse Detective. They directed Little Mermaid, Hercules, Moana, Aladdin. A strong pedigree going back as animators and then become directors. And I guess that this really kind of languished in development hell for years. And they kept trying to push it through, push it through. And finally, I think the Disney execs came to them and they wanted them to direct Hercules. And they said, well, direct Hercules, but only if you let us finally make this movie. And then it bombed. Horrible that a labor of love like this, because it really, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm looking at it through my children's eyes, through my wife's eyes. as what She was thrilled to think that we were going to sit down and watch this again. We haven't watched it in, in quite a few years because, like, you know, my kids are older now. They don't like to curl up on the couch and watch Disney movies. It is one of my favorites. I think it's completely underappreciated. And I think it's it's clever. It's not groundbreaking in any way, shape, or form. Story-wise, you know, they adhere pretty close to what Treasure Island was. It just happens to take place in space. And so I'm, I am curious what you guys felt. Well, or- Jeff, uh, after watching like four basketball games yesterday, I popped <laughs> it in, I want to say like at 11 o'clock, and fell asleep when they got to Treasure Planet. How does it oh. end? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you were invested up to that point <laughs> i was i did enjoy the animation and i enjoyed the story as well so yeah. i mean i just uh, i mean it, it does very much is very much a disney movie oh absolutely it, and I, it, I i like the fact that it gets you off balance right from the get-go because it begins with a mother telling her uh, little son a story about pirates 
and you realize that, okay, everything is not as it should be because the book itself is like a virtual book where they open it and the pictures are moving. So you're like, okay, this is not on our timeline. Then you realize it's not even on our planet or galaxy right. as it goes right. on a little bit further. The planet is Montressor. Montressor, yep. Which really reminded me, if you guys remember the Peter Cottontail, Rankin Bass, Easter television special. Okay. Vincent Price played a character called Iron Tail, who was the bad guy. And his bat was named Montressor. So no, no, whenever no. they would say Montressor, I think That's it's exactly spelled the same way. That's what yeah. I thought. <laughs> Montresor, Montresor. I love the fact that you slowly realize without them hitting you over the head with it, this is not taking place on Earth until they right. actually reveal the name of the planet that they're on. And that's a real old school Disney storytelling device, which is to give you, you know, it all opens with the storybook and you're getting all of the uh, exposition right up front in the story as the kid is little Jim Hawkins is, is obsessed with the, the pirates of stories. And, you know, and he's like, where do you think he hit all the treasure? And the mom's like, oh, those are just stories. Yeah, I, it is a little dated because you watch that opening sequence, you know, and it's, it's like extreme skateboarding, parkouring kind of a thing going on there. And I'm like, oh, this is like so 90s. It's just <laughs> and the fire. character animation, especially on Jim Hawkins, is very Tarzan-esque with those yes. you know, the wide set eyes. That's a little dated as well, but it's the only yeah. instance where the animation is dated is in that character. Yeah, and he had this weird... So Joseph Gordon-Levitt played Jim Hawkins. And if you notice the character, like you said, the eyes are pretty wide set, but he had this kind of a grayish pink mask thing that went around his eyes. And it was very distracting to me as a kid. And he always, as a kid, because it was a weird design choice. And he always seemed to have like a wrinkle under one eye kind of a thing. And I guess when they were designing him, they really wanted him to be a uh, James Dean type of bad boy. And so that was one of their ways of playing it up that he had this kind of mask. And as the movie goes on, not only do his clothes go from dark to light, but he does lose the mask, implying that he's kind of found himself and not such a bad boy anymore, which I, it's, a, it's just a weird throwaway thing. That, but I will say, like you said, I watched the Blu-ray and this is the first time I'd seen the Blu-ray because we had the DVD. Yeah. And the anime, I mean, it is crystal clear. It is beautiful. One of the versions of Treasure Island that came out years ago was illustrated by a famous artist named N.C. Wyeth. And he was well known for these lush, gorgeous oil paintings. And I think that they, they really kind of took to some of his color schemes for the galaxies and the universe behind them that had like this, almost like a chewiness to it. I don't know how else to describe it, but it really, it, to me, it felt like the artist went out of the way to really kind of capture some of that, that Wyeth artwork. And I like the, uh, the, it's not a musical. There's one song montage, and I brought this up last week, which is Johnny Resnick from the Goo Goo Dolls. Again, you know, very 90s. He did this little Jim's theme song kind of a thing. I enjoy it. I thought it was just a very well put together movie. I did enjoy the music. I thought it was good. I like the fact that they could travel in space and not have to confine themselves to spacesuits or whatever. It's, I guess it's called the Ethereum rather than outer space, and it's filled with atmosphere. So you can travel through it on a pirate ship. Like you yeah, they, the they leave it very vague. I mean, there's a yeah. scene where they leave Spaceport and, you know, they lock in the, the gravitational well and it just, you know, sucks everybody to the deck. And that's it. You don't question... Yeah. You know, is there a bubble around this thing? If he pops out, are you going to breathe space and die? You just, you just go with it. Yeah, it's like and, a nebulous sea because you get like sea creatures that are that are swimming b beside them in space. Right, so you get the Orcus Galacticus, which is, again is a, is a full-on CG character. And I will tell you, back in the mid-90s, I shopped around. I have a comic book that I pushed for years called Newt's Tale. And the concept was that outer space is like a, a vast ocean. So you had these sea creatures, you had space whales, you had the bad guys all had like Nautilus ships that they had commandeered and turned into battleships. And so to see this on screen, it was like, they stole my idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I can never do this because it just looks like I'm ripping them off. But it doesn't sound like a lot of people saw this movie, so maybe I could still do it. So we have not brought up Martin Short's character yet. And Bioelectronic Navigator. 
plastic, a carbon-based life form come to rescue me at last. I just want to hug you and squeeze you and hold you close to me. I, I've, I've been marooned for uh, so long. I mean, <laughs> solitude's fun. Don't get me wrong, for heaven's sakes, after a hundred years, you got a little nuts. <laughs> now, he is doing his best, I think, to channel Jerry Lewis in this movie. <laughs> shoes and socks of pantyhose a pretty lady hello there cute puppy children with the spooky faces oh, ah! he is he is full-on crack he is yeah. <laughs> martin short at his highest peak but it is it's when his character shows up and i was waiting and waiting for this to happen like he's not on yet where is he so so finally he comes through about more than halfway through the movie and yeah um, he's, it's well in yeah, and you've already not got really a little good. bit of comic relief with the little morph character, but not much. It's just a little cute aside. He he puts some wind under the movie sails to bring a pun into this. He brings the comedy relief that David Hyde Pierce has been bringing from the beginning of the movie. But then we have Emma Thompson's character, Captain Amelia, who gets wounded when they crash down. And so David Hyde Pierce has to stay with her. So Jim, he's uh, Delbert Doppler, who's kind of yeah. like a goofy. He looks, he's like a space dog, I guess. I don't know how else you would probably uh, explain his character, but yeah, and the relationship between those two characters, because he's this flustered professor. Oh my goodness, that was more fun than I ever want to have again. <laughs> um, and even when you see him, uh, when you're first introduced to him at the Benbow. And you get Jim's mom and the little kid comes up to his table. He's trying to eat his dinner and the little kid comes, oh, hello. How are you? Cat got your tongue. And the little alien opens his mouth and friggin' eats his dinner off his fork. And she's like, aren't they cute? He goes, oh, yeah, deplorable. I mean, they're adorable. You know, so he's constantly, <laughs> he's funny. But yeah, Ben just takes it up a notch because he is this hyperactive i mean again i've seen this numerous times but i still laugh he's like what was i ever dancing with an android named lupe <laughs> like he just breaks into these stupid non sequenters because he lost his mind right, and that's yeah. part of the story which you realize that they've now made it to the treasure planet and they're trying to find the loot obviously silver who was set up to be the bad guy and that's the one thing i like it this is a very non-conventional disney movie because you don't have a love interest. You don't have a Disney princess. And your bad guy is really not a bad guy. I mean, he takes Jim under his wing. And I think that holds true, I think, to a lot of the original storyline that Long John Silver, while he was a pirate, really kind of took on the father figure because that's the one thing you realize is that Jim's dad left. Yeah. And he's kind of his troubled kid. Um, and the other great thing about this is that they did not feel the need to tie that back in at the end of this movie. Like, like his dad is not one of the characters that already exists. Right. Right. Or that somehow, you know, he comes to just appreciate who and what he was and not drive his mother nuts. And the mom's not an evil stepmother. She's a caring parent who doesn't know what to do with her kid. That's the one thing we didn't bring up, which is how he gets his treasure map, Billy Bones, who's a really cool, like a space tortoise. I guess you never really see if he has a yeah. shell, but he's a really coolly designed. And that's Patrick Maguhan who was in the uh, the original Avengers with Emma Peel. Yeah, and apparently right. this was his last role. That right? was his last role. So he died on screen and then he died in real life. Uh, and I found out the guy who played Silver, Brian Murray, he also just died last year as well. Uh, and that's a really fun, nuanced character because you never really know. And again, that's where the CG, where he's half 2D, all of his cyborg parts are 3D. They're CG created and his, his arm can change into a knife when he's cutting things up or he's got a gun or he turns into a hand. So it's neat little throwaway stuff like that that kind of takes it to the next level. And not to ruin anything, but people die. A couple guys die. And talk about the treasure map. I'm convinced that they stole a little bit of that for Prometheus when they the map opens and you see a big map of the galaxy all around them. Well, they did the same thing in uh, The Force Awakens. So take that thought, which is there are two scenes in this movie that I am absolutely convinced that J.J. Abrams stole for his Star Trek reboot. The opening sequence where Jim is on his little space glider yeah. and he's being chased by the cops, straight up Kirk is a kid being chased by the cops in his dad's stolen car. I felt the same way. With the soundtrack. I mean, obviously he didn't have Sabotage was uh, the soundtrack in Star Trek. And then there's another scene where they're getting sucked into a black hole, which first, by the way, I mean, I'm going to throw my science hat on a little bit. A, a star doesn't go supernova and then immediately turn into a black hole. But I guess for the sake of storytelling, <laughs> it immediately becomes a black hole and they get sucked into it. 
but I'm pretty sure that in Star Trek, they use the explosion to catapult themselves out of it, which is exactly what they do in this story as well. And this came out long before that Star Trek reboot. But tit for tat, tit for tat, there is a Star Trek joke in here. Oh, yes. Delbert which is, says, you know, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor. Well, I'm a doctor, yeah. but not that kind of a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a Star Trek throwaway joke. Uh, and there's another one. He goes, go Dilbert, go Dilbert, which again is like so 90s. It's just kind right, of right. like... Yeah, it is. It's a Jaws joke, too. We're going to need a bigger boat for the... For yes, the yeah. Find the We're going to yeah. The dialogue is really clever and witty, and especially the captain, Captain Amelia, because she's because Emma Thompson, so she's kind of like this upper crust captain, and she's cool. She's a cool cat design, which was also one of my character designs. So I absolutely, these people somehow <laughs> stuck into my studio and stole every idea I had. And at one point she goes, you know, Jim, they're on the ship. Goes, oh, this is the boy who found the treasure map. She goes, zip your screaming howler. I think that was probably uh, said a couple times in my house over the last couple of years. Now, do we remember the Happy Meal toys that came about because of Treasure Planet? Yes, they are actually, I think, highly sought after. I would imagine there are. They have one. I was looking online and they had the whole line. Just, I just was curious to see what kind of merchandise came out around this. I don't think much. You know, I showed last week this, this I have the, the Ben, which is probably a 16 inch figure you plug his little brain back into him and he and he says different lines of dialogue and that was i bought because my son's name is ben and we like the movie found it on toys r us rack for next to nothing and he sat in the package in the kid's closet for probably two three years and then one day we just broke it out and played with it and that thing goes for a ridiculous amount of money now right in the packet um, yeah, we, i actually found the mcdonald's happy meal commercial which i would nice. like to play for I'd like to hear it can you play that for us i will play it right now <laughs> treasure planet is flying into mcdonald's there's a world of treasure to discover at McDonald's, like the hidden surprise with each of these toys based on Disney's new movie, Treasure Planet, only in a McDonald's Happy Meal. So and there's also, which I couldn't find, apparently there were Pepsi promotions, there were Kellogg's promotions, uh, Hasbro had a toy line, which I'm sure that that 16-inch Ben is part of. Probably among them, yeah. So, but as we said, it was a failure at the box office. It cost $140 million to make. It made $38 million in the Yeah, US. which is a huge bomb. Um, $109 million, including that 38 worldwide. So even worldwide, it didn't um, make back its budget. And it was put up against, I think it really had some unfair disadvantages against it. It was put out against the second Harry Potter movie, The Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. Uh, whatever James Bond movie was coming out at the time was against it. And Disney's own The Santa Claus came out against it as well. Oh, just one of my favorites. <laughs> like I said, I never, I never saw it in the theater. So it's sure. like Disney stacked everything against this movie from yeah. succeeding. You know, it's, I, and plus it was, you know, as we were saying, it's very unconventional in terms of being a Disney movie. Right. It, it's, Probably marketing it really only would resonate marketing wise with boys rather than girls because there are no yeah there were, no outside of the the captain outside really of her no, yeah. and the mother and the mother who is a strong mother that's Lori Metcalf by the way who yes, yes. plays Andy's mom in Toy Story Jeff you'll probably know this but I read that they were planning a direct to video sequel yeah. a possible TV series and that just fell apart when the yeah and I think was it Willem Dafoe that oh, was yeah. set to play Blackbeard yep. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And again, it looked like they were going to bring in a love interest for Jim. So there you go right down the Disney rabbit hole with, oh, you know, so you take everything that didn't work, I guess. <laughs> this one. Yeah. So I don't think I ever would have seen this movie ever if you hadn't brought this. And that's sad because you are such a Disney file. Yeah. So I'm curious how Harrison reacted did he like it not like oh, it? he was... liked it and he laughed out loud especially with uh uh david hyde pierce's character doppler yeah. So... yeah oh there's a there's a great joke when they first get on the ship and there's this cool alien creature that talks with <laughs> yeah and he's oh, like oh yeah. i speak i speak fluent flatula so, so buckets man how many buckets Can i have I, to go I, at I'm least gonna... I got to go at least four and a half on me. It's, cool. it's, it is it is a movie that I, I – and then I'm glad that we got to talk about it because if it, it, it makes someone else go out and check it out. And if you look it up online, you'll see that there's a fair amount of people that, that truly appreciate this and love this underappreciated Disney movie. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled to spread the word. Yeah, Check it out. Apparently, it's an available in all of our libraries. So I would go probably three and three quarters on okay. this one. It was, I thought it was very well done. I loved the animation. 
it's really the reason that you want to watch these things on Blu-ray. It just popped, kicked, you know, hit me over the head, whatever you want to say. The animation was just stunning on the Blu-ray. Yeah, the colors, like I said, yeah. the colors, they really, they, if you go and look up NCYF, you'll see where they kind of called that from. And you know what's funny is that I forget I forgot about this until now that one of the things that I looked up doing research for this was the first trailer. And it opens with the spaceport, with the crescent moon. So it looks like in the beginning of the trailer that you're watching a dreamscape movie. It <laughs> okay. looks like the opening of a dreamscape movie. And then right. the camera pans into it and you realize, okay, you're it's, not looking at a moon That's at all. pretty funny. Yeah. Because that was dreamscape in our infancy. I mean, Yes, it, it was. It was yeah. That was right after Shrek was when this movie came out. DreamWorks. DreamWorks, yeah. Dreamscape. I, know, that, okay. uh, I knew what you were thinking. Dreamscape Quaid was a movie, completely right? different movie. <laughs> We should cover that one day too. Oh, I'll See, do that. I think how many t if I had a nickel for every time we say we should do that movie, we should do that movie, and you know, I know. Well, that's what keeps us going, right? It is. It There's is. just a lot of movies out there that you forget about, or you know, have a, that resonate with us at some. So, point. Mike, I know you didn't watch the whole thing. Uh, from what I saw, I got about maybe I feel like three quarters of the way through. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it. I'd go three and a half. Okay, nice. that's solid. I'm gonna, you know. Now, did you even see the Ben character that was uh, Martin Short, or no? Were you out? No, I was out by then. Okay. Oh, he's worth checking out because, he, like Jim said, he really does kind of infuse uh, new life into the movie. Because at this point, you're familiar with the other characters, but he is frenetic. Uh, I will finish it after our podcast. Nice. I like it. Oh, by the way, September 19th is officially Talk Like a Pirate Day. Ooh. Just so you know, put that on your calendar. Okay, let's remember that. So this leads us to our confessional this week. Confessionals. And I hope you guys had time to mull this over because we just came mull up with it, it yesterday. I know. Um, <laughs> Wait, it was, oh, it was yesterday, wasn't it? At yeah, 10 o'clock at night. Was, favorite robot is the question. Beedy, 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 beedy. So do you guys have any clear-cut favorites here of Hell yeah. terms of uh, robots? Absolutely. I was going to deviate, and then I said, why? Why am I going to shut down my, my main robot? So you want me to go first? Right, go you first. go first. Yes, please. Come on. If you don't know who my favorite robot is of all time, I'm going to have you guys guess right now, based on all the crap behind me. R2? Or R2-D2. R2-D2 is the gold standard of what a robot is. And you cannot argue with me in any way, shape. He literally saves the day at every turn in all three of those movies. Well, six. Unequivocally loyal and stubborn at the same yes. time. He is the T-Rex of the Star Wars movies. Right. He is. He's the, he's the Swiss Army knife. He's a go-to guy. You need to smuggle Death Star plants? He's your guy. He's the guy. You need to find the escape off a of Star Destroyer? I got it. Locates yeah. Obi-Wan, unlocks Princess Leia's cell block. Uh, he helps him escape from uh, the garbage compactor by shutting down all the garbage on the tension level. He talks to Cloud City and he, he figures Cloud out the uh, hyperspace City. problem fixes, with the, Falcon. the Millennium Falcon's hyperdrive. Yeah. And he smuggles a Luke, uh, Luke's lightsaber into Jabba's palace. Yes, he does. Yes, yeah, he, he does. keisters it. And so, he provides uh, countless moments of comic relief in all these movies. And those are just in the, those are the original trilogy. We didn't even get yeah. into the prequels. His flying yeah. abilities in the, in the yeah, movie. which come on, if he could do that the whole time, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did that stop? Why? <laughs> Why? Right? Exactly. Oh, we forgot the fact that he could serve up a mean drink too on Jabba's palace. Even yes, when he was yeah. a, a droid slave, he was like, "Screw it, I'm still going." Yeah. Falls in. And he is probably the best screamer in cinematic history. And he takes a bullet for Luke in the Death Star Trench. You can't ask for a better yes, wing. Yes, he character. does. That's right. R2-D2 right. is the man. Droid, whatever you want to call him. Mm. So that's my number one. That is, I, And I was going to go Iron Giant, but I said I can't. I can't. You couldn't I can't. have the passion for I that. I can't that leave R2 awesome. on the sidelines, even though it was uh, almost obvious. So there you go. That's my R2. I don't know if mine counts. You guys can tell me <laughs> if it does or does not is count. Is it a robot, not a robot? Well, this is, this is where I'm wondering, is it a robot, not a robot? Ah. Number six from Battlestar Galactica. I would have to definitely put her in the robot yes, category. I would. say that that is a valid choice. So she wins the sexiest robot. So for the passion that you have for R2-D2, mine is at more of a carnal level. And yeah. so if it's possible to love a robot, I love number six. Yeah, that's right up. I, that's not a bad choice at all. Listen, get into my head any day. Blowing spine and all. Oh, yeah. 
I'll, I'll buy that. I'd like. It. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, now I want to guess yours, but I want to hear you say it, and then I'll let you know if I was right or not. Okay, my favorite. Write it down on a piece of paper, Mike, and then put okay. it up to the <laughs> drum roll. He was only in one movie, one and done. Oh, oh, oh that already negates. Okay. Uh, he has the ability to alter his size at will, and he has a giant smile, so he's happy most of the time. I'm going to give it to Jet Jaguar. And I was going to go Mecha Godzilla. That's what I was going with, Mecha Godzilla. Right. Yeah, no, Mecha Godzilla, see, same universe, was, though. Yeah, same universe, yes, but no. Mecha Godzilla does not have a song. That is true. That is does. true. Jet Jaguar. Jet Jaguar. Jaguar. Yeah. And I just realized in researching this that Jet Jaguar was created by a kid. Yeah. It was, like a, it was like a contest. And that movie was supposed to be straight up a Jet Jaguar movie. And they didn't think that he could hold his own. So they brought in, that was the Megalon? Megalon, yes. And then they mm -hmm. brought in Godzilla. But if you watch that movie, Meg Godzilla's not in it a lot. <laughs> no, he just shows up at the end because Jet right. Jaguar goes to get him. And he spends most of the movie swimming from Monster Island to get to the Because <laughs> <Right. flight. laughs> there was no flights. No, no flights. No. But Jim, I think you should probably just change it to Mecha Godzilla so you can conform to the vision that Jeff and I have of you. <laughs> right. Um, so Jim's is Mecha Godzilla. If anyone... I like it. I like it. But I, I also Mecha have Godzilla. to share before we are out the the little kids screaming, Jet Jaguar! Jet Jaguar! <laughs> it was annoying. I would have stepped on him by the end of that movie. I'm a kid, dude. Cause just chill. But just the cool special sound effects. <laughs> Whenever yeah. he flashes well, he a little does, fist yeah, or whatever. He's got to do the, you know, the, the hand to the elbow before he either shrinks right. or before he grows. That's kind of like Shazam. He's got to yell Shazam to become Shazam, uh, which I saw last night, by the way. Yeah. Hush, 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 Jeff, please. We got two more weeks to talk about I this. know. I got to write notes now because I'll forget. This is what happened with Aquaman. So, yeah, so, so that's, man. Jeff, you know, very apropos that you bring that up now because it's time to talk about next week's episode. <gasps> next week? We're going to be next back? Week. Yeah, 52. This is our season finale. Our this season is season finale. one. Last episode of season one. So we are going back to the cinemas next week to see the latest Tim Burton movie. And it, which happens to be the latest Disney movie as well, the live action version of Dumbo. And as a co feature with Dumbo, we're sticking with Tim Burton and revisiting one that I haven't seen in years and years and years Mars Attacks. Here's my favorite line from that movie. Ag -ag. <laughs> there are so many stars in Mars Attack. It's it's like it's like it's a mad, 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 mad world yeah. with aliens. With aliens. It is a plethora of Big name stars. It's ridiculous how many people are in this movie. Uh, I can't wait to see it. Now, now, Mike, do you have any specific memories of Mars Attacks? Or... I've never seen it. You've never seen it? Okay. No. What? So... Okay. All right. I'm I like checking it. the library app now. now I had mine. Mine already get, came in. Yeah, it did kind of get overshadowed, I remember, by Independence Day because they came out very Around close to 96, each other. 96. Yeah, 96. Yeah. So, um... Independence Day took all the, the headlines back then, but we're going to give it back. We're going to give it back. Yeah. I got it. So oh. next week, our season finale of TMI, season one. So cool. please listen. Thanks for listening today. Yes, thank you very much. Go check out Treasure Planet, please. Yeah, do so. Throw us some love. I recommend Treasure Planet. And love death and robots. But uh, make sure the kids are out of the room. Yes. Yeah. And turn the volume down as well. <laughs> Put on the closed caption. All right, gentlemen. All right, that's it. We're out of here. All right. Ciao.